Thanks for joining us this morning. Um, maybe just quickly have each of you uh, introduce yourselves and, and your firm and, and your role in the topic today. So Amir, we'll start with you. Hi everyone, this is Amir. Uh, I'm Director of Product Management for AWS EC2 Edge, which includes all of our compute services uh, outside of AWS availability zones and predominantly being used by telcos as potential telco cloud. Hello, this is uh, Mark, I'm with Dish. Uh, um, the chief network officer uh, at Dish, and, but I like to say I'm the 5G architect. I think it's cooler. <laughs> uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm uh, Niall Norton. I'm general manager inside Amdocs Technology on the networking software division. I wish I had his cool title, actually. Yeah. <laughs> it is cool. Good, good. Thank you. Maybe to get started, Mark, uh, your firm, Dish, really made an important and big announcement this last summer in your desire to launch your service in the public cloud in partnership with, with Nokia and, and AWS. Maybe a little bit of background about what drove that decision to go to the public cloud with your service launch and, uh, and what you've experienced so far. Yeah, I think the, the number one driver was that uh, as a telco, a future telco, we, uh, we felt uh, frustrated that uh, the cloud guys had a speed uh, of innovation that were just killing us. And uh, we said that's not fair, so we need the same uh, innovation speed. So that was really the driver, and then we engineered it to see how we could do it. Now I would say uh, we've been one year into it, and uh, it's better than I expected. Uh, so for me, it's like, wow. I, I wish I had known it even before. I mean, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's amazing. Any hurdles so far or any, any things that have surprised you? Um, we, uh, we were very strict. Uh, we were lucky because uh, we came at a time where the, the maturity was getting there and we could uh, be very strict about saying everything has to be really cloud native. So we have actually we've published 14 principles, nothing new about cloud uh, na nativeness, but we were very strict about it, right? And uh, our partners know uh, how strict we were like microservice based, uh, you know, uh, automated onboarding and, and, and uh, you know, uh, disaggregated uh, uh, data access and so on, so on, so on. And uh, it was tough because some of our vendors were not ready, but we had time and, and now we are in a stage where everybody is compliant to our principles. So we can, we can onboard automatically, you know, we get new software. I mean, it's really automatic. Uh, where we have tested it to the point where I am personally watching, it's one push, you know, actually it's even starting by the machine, nobody's allowed to touch. And if you, if you have to touch, you have to do it again until you don't touch it. And we've done that across the board. Um, and now we're moving to data, uh, you know, data access. The amount of data we're getting, everything is observable. And that's, it's just amazing, you know, you, you see everything so you can play with it, you can do, uh, um, you know, personally, I'm only hiring data scientists uh, because uh, you know it's all about automation of data. The net humans should do nothing, and we're starting to play with the data of the network, and it's it's so cool. You know, we have ideas yeah. all over the time. Yeah, really neat. Uh, Amir, I'd like to turn to you. This is the first 5G launch in the United States of, of service in a public cloud. From your perspective at Amazon, um, what, what's that experience been like in working with Dish? And, and, uh, and what's that look like through your lens? Well, first of all, it's a privilege to be part of uh, such a groundbreaking and industry-making motion. Um, so thanks to Dish and our technology partners uh, like Nokia and others in the journey. Uh, it has been phenomenal. I mean, we've built large, fully automated, because you think about it, AWS or Amazon, in building public cloud, we built probably the largest automated infrastructure. That's what it is. And I think where we have come to appreciate is the nuances of some of the challenges the telecom operators have to face from a mission critical uh, resilience that we have to deliver using the cloud services and not compromising on, as Mark mentioned, the automation, the agility, because that's the core value that we can bring. It's, it's been a huge learning curve. Uh, we've rolled out, uh, as, as, as was announced last year, we've ro rolled out 16 local zones in the United States. We've announced another 31 local zones. Outside of you, we believe that with that proliferation of AWS, EC2, or compute services outside of our traditional data centers, availability zones, we would potentially can meet the requirement of bringing the cloud and, and connectivity together to be able to meet the 
as some of us refer to it in the industry, the intent-based orchestration, where the customer that would require a network slice can actually use the connectivity slice with the right compute paradigm involved. So it's been a huge learning curve, we are still learning, and I'm very glad that we are delivering uh, to our partners and to Dish's expectations. Yeah, th thanks, Samir. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to turn to you from Amdocs. Um, wh what's your experience been as people are moving in telco to the public cloud and, and your role in it? Yeah, uh, thanks. Um, first of all, I'd like to congratulate Mark and, and the team in Dish. I've known the guys through the industry and what seems like a, a almost commonplace as an idea wasn't commonplace six months ago or 12 months ago or 18 months ago. So the bravery the guys had to kind of pioneer in that space is, 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 is phenomenal. The public cloud is, is uh, an enabler for a whole new way of doing business. Uh, what telco becomes in the future is, uh, you know, it, it becomes like the internet. It's, it's, it's impossible to imagine doing business without. And so the move into the public cloud requires an enabling infrastructure which is automated and all of the things that the guys have got right and that will continue to improve. It also requires a capacity to go all the way out to the edge so you can do clever things out at the edge. It changes the value chain because historically uh, telcos tried to talk to consumers or businesses directly in the future. I think as you look at private enterprise networks and edge computing and all these other things, you need SIs who are vertically vertically brilliantly well versed. So the, the relationship between vendors and the telcos, and telcos through to SIs and SIs through to the, the end industries, it's phenomenal and that's one of the things about One World Congress this year, we're seeing a, a whole redrawing of the lines. So it, it, it's almost trite to say that the guys have got the technology right. We work very closely with AWS we moved, rather than kind of be half pregnant on the idea of being in the cloud, we moved everything in OpenNet where I was CEO onto the AWS cloud back in November. I mean, 20 years of code in four weeks. And now we, you know, we were writing new code on, a, on an on-prem solution in October. We were writing new cloud and putting software releases into the marketplace in December. Uh, so we got some experience uh, you know, in a good way, so we end up with a lot of cloud evangelists. Instead of having 40 cloud evangelists, I now have 1,400 cloud evangelists inside the business. So you gotta live it to see it, but I, I, you know, I agree with uh, uh, what Mark was saying. It's, it's, it's a very different way of thinking about things, which is great. It's actually a very positive experience. Yeah. Mark, picking up on that, and, and one of the things DR talked about in her, her discussion earlier was the ability to capture customers' needs kind of beyond the current business models. Uh, maybe start with you, but go on to the others as well. Uh, what are your thoughts at DISH about other use cases, other ways to monetize that subscriber? Yeah, I, I mean, I don't want to, 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 to share some of the, the cool things we're preparing, but um, because it's competitive, of course, but what we can do in the mobility, um, I have been a mobility engineer for you know thir three decades, and I've been dreaming of things. And uh, we can do more than I was dreaming of. And, and uh, you know, we're going to try and play with all these uh, concepts uh, that, that are going to change the way we consume, uh, we, we consume uh, you know, data and the mobility and the access to uh, knowledge. So, and and why, is that, why can we do that? Because it's so open, it's everything is software. Um, and we have all the tools of the public cloud, so we, you know, we just use them. Um, as as uh, some of you know, we have Kubernetes all the way to down to the towers, so it's, it's only Kubernetes everywhere, and uh, we're not buying anything but software uh, from the telco industry. It's, uh, it's pure uh, microservice everywhere. Um, so yeah, the benefits are, are huge. I'll just give you an example to, to show you how dif different our world is now. We don't have physical labs anymore. One of the big things about the telco is that they have huge labs and they're testing for months because of reliability and scale and everything. They're testing for months and months and months. We don't have that anymore. We just have uh, vi virtual private instances that we can spin off in hours. So I need a new lab, spin it off. It's fully automated, test it, fully automated. Logs are analyzed by the machine with uh, you know, natural language processing and everything. And we create automatically the, the, the logs and the tickets to the vendors. And we don't even know it. We don't even see it. Yeah. We don't touch it. 
Um, and they can correct and they can upload the software automatically and, and it's tested automatically because we give them sandboxes that are virtual uh, instances of our network. I mean, it's, it's fascinating. Yeah. And uh, so what I'm telling my, my vendors is my metric for software is the more bugs, the happier am I because it means they, they have the speed. So they go very fast and you know that, you know, we keep talking about that. How many bugs did you find today? Oh, not enough, go for it, go for it. <laughs> and we just keep going and, and the curves are going up. Of course, they need to be corrected. So the speed of innovation is just what matters. Yeah, yeah. Amazon's been kind of a king of speed and innovation. Um, how do you view your partnership in launching a telco service and what does that mean for Amazon? First of all, the experience is, is phenomenal. And just to give you a little bit of history, and Niall would know this, we've, we've been, been playing with most of the telecom industry leaders, ISVs or NEPs as we call them, for more than four, four to five years now. DISH has given us the perfect opportunity to actually bring all of that knowledge and experience together across the OSS, the BSS, the automation journey that we've built with our partners and the core and the RAN. So, as Mark was men mentioning, the biggest fundamental difference is in cloud, there is no separate prod and test environment. It is the same environment. Mm -hmm. That fundamentally gives you the agility that, that you need to meet the new customer requirements. And the thesis really here is that 5G is going to unlock an unprecedented amount of scale in, in, in terms of complexity. It's not about that we'll, we'll need to, or the telecom operators would need to create network slices, they'll have to create potentially, I don't know, X number of slices per day or per, per hour. And with that kind of agility, you, you can't just afford to be manual. And from our perspective and our enterprise customer experience perspective, it's a great opportunity and great partnership, which is why I keep hammering about the need of telco and the operator in the cloud coming together without any inhibition is because the end customer would need to run their use cases and, and that is those, the connectivity, the slices that the 5G network will provide would be different for different use cases. So we have to take into account the compute resources, the associated storage resources, uh, and the cloud offering. And there's no better place if the telecom operator of tomorrow, hopefully Dish, could actually take the position and say, okay, we can meet your need on the demand, on, on the fly, and we can automate network resources on demand, because that's, that's the bottleneck when, you, once you, when, when you're not playing with cloud, when you're playing with definitive hardware. So all in all, I think this is, is a great promise, and let's see what future unlocks for all of us. Yeah, yeah, no, thanks, Samir. Yeah, you know, you've been in a great position to see a lot of the challenges and obstacles that people have faced uh, moving in this direction. Could you talk about some of those and how people are overcoming those? Yeah, you know, it's fascinating because listening to Mark, uh, um, and having worked very closely with Amir and, and AWS, for the first time that I can remember ever, and I've been in the industry you know, 30 plus years at this stage, um, technology is, fa is moved faster than marketing imagination. <laughs> and the enabling capabilities are there, and they are going to be exposed to the customers. And that's what Amir was saying about the increasing complexity. It's a very good complexity rather than the bad complexity of spaghetti in the network and so on. Um, I think the challenge moving forward is making sure that you can scale up elegantly with expected performances, and then you use AI to start forecasting what your workloads will look like so that you, you, know, you can anticipate and delight and surprise customers. You can monetize experiences, you know, whether it's super low latency or very high definition pictures, or sometimes you want to you know, proactively uh, do revenue share deals. And, it's the 700 different monetization models of the concert in Central Park that you want to spin up on a Friday afternoon and, and close it down on a Sunday morning. All of these things are now well within our grasp today. And I think that's one of the things that the, uh, the opportunity that DISH have had. But it, for years, people have talked about Industry 4.0 and what will happen next. We're on the cusp of it. I mean, uh, when Danielle was doing uh, her introduction, a lot of what she says is right, and I wouldn't always agree with Danielle about lots of things, but you know, she was on the money with, with a number of uh, different things. Um, our experience of being along for the journey, when I was, again, in, you know, in 
my old company before I joined the Amdocs Technology Group, we reorganized entirely inside Amdocs Technology to be cloud first, to build double down on some of the design principles that we had around microservices and service-based architecture, because vendors are now struggling to keep up with the demands, which is great. Yeah. It's, it's a first class challenge. Yeah, yeah, certainly, good. And one of those challenges, I think, as we all move forward is talent and, and acquiring the right talent. And Mark, I'd love to hear from you. You certainly had a lot of engineering talent and a lot of the product talent in your existing business at DISH. What, yeah. What's it look like going forward no, for, not for as, this talent base? Not as much uh, as that. I mean, um, some people know that uh, my complete technology and architecture team uh, from DISH is less than 20 people. And um, my competitors have thousands. And uh, so our talent is not us. Our talent is uh, these guys. You know, and they know because we have the list of all their best engineers. Yeah. And we say that's the ones we want. And they, it, we put a huge pressure on them to give us uh, you know, hundreds of the best engineers. And we manage that on a weekly basis. You, you know that, Amir. And um, so that's our talent. Because there is no way we can build a talent pool uh, that will ever uh, replicate what these guys do. Um, so the talents I'm trying to attract are data scientists, because what I own is the data of the network and how we manage the network. Now the other great thing about uh, the, the public cloud is beyond AWS is that I have access to Salesforce, people that are deep into it, to Adobe, to ServiceNow. I have a complete messaging, uh, enterprise messaging ecosystem with uh, Confluent, Kafka. I have access to technologists that are the best in the world, and they are excited, so they come, yeah. and they give me their best talents. Yeah. And if they don't, we ask them to give <laughs> us their best talents. And you know, engineers, they are excited. You give them a cool project, they come, yeah. right? So we have access to incredible uh, capabilities. Yeah, yeah, a great point. I think the power of the ecosystem is the, is the shift. Yeah, we, we're happening. so small in that ecosystem. We're nobody, right? Yeah. The ecosystem is coming to us, yeah. and uh, we love it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Amir, how, how is it for you to manage that ecosystem and the demands that get placed on you at, at, at AWS? I think this, this is a great question that you've asked and Mark's answer leads me to, I mean, there's a misnomer in the industry thinking that telco is fundamentally something different from the cloud. Essentially, what are we trying to do from a telco perspective? You, a customer needs a service, that service needs to be provisioned, that service needs to be assured, that service needs to be built, we do the same. So if you think about the whole closed loop automation, which is the biggest thing from a resilience of a telecom operator perspective, cloud provider is exactly doing the same things, which is actually why, yes, we have to expose our engineers and our principals to Mark's point about the nuances of resiliency or the different type of service that it's not compute, it's voice or it's data pipe, but essentially they are people within AWS and of course uh, within the ecosystem who understand closed loop automation, who understands how service needs to be assured and what are the parameters. And that's why I think it's a, it's a great opportunity for us and not only within our own organization but also working with the likes of, with the likes of Nokia, with the likes of Amdocs because essentially we are creating service engines that's, that enables the telecom operator to offer an end customer service which I repeat, needs to be provisioned, needs to be provided for, needs to be assured. And if we can do that, we can enable our customers. We can enable Dish, and I think we hopefully, we can proliferate this deployment model to many other countries. Yeah, yeah. Where, where do you think this goes? Like, what, what do you see the industry ending up at? Me? You, yeah. I mean, the topic's very passionate <laughs> and close to, to my heart. I think, I think we'll see much, much more of it. There's not a single conversation, and which where we haven't seen, okay, cloud and inhibitions. I think I'm seeing more and more the thousand pound gorilla, you know, the public cloud, the operator, uh, the OTT conversations, uh, they need to get addressed. Uh, and I think we will see a lot more of the two worlds coming together to offer the, the customer experience because that is the only way we all win. That is the only way the ecosystem wins and the customer and the end consumer wins. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah your thoughts? Yeah, so I agree with Amir substantially. I think the nobody quite knows what's coming next, but we know, and I think Mark's done a good job of mapping it, what's required to support a variety of potentials of what comes next. And I think from a, an engineering perspective, we'll continue to nuance that across the vendor community, including you know the cloud partnerships <coughs> with the software vendors and so on. 
Um, I'm a huge optimist about what comes next from an innovation point of view because it won't be anybody on this stage who creates the next Uber. It'll be somebody using the tools that the three people at this stage have put together. If, yeah. You know what I mean? It's, it's the strong sense they get. And I get very excited by that because it just removes barriers to entry, which inhibited that kind of innovation, which makes, I believe, society ultimately better and uh, the world better. Yeah, yeah. And, and a, a lot, I think, in that ecosystem, some of the things that I've heard talking to people about this week are, are, are trying to push the power of, of the platform and the experience and the service to those new end users and yeah. to those new business models. And, and really taking a lot of edge computing concepts and putting them at the forefront of, of how those use cases get solved. Yeah, I think openness is, is, is the unspoken part maybe that we, you know, that everybody agrees with spiritually, but it wasn't always at all the case in the industry. You know, software vendors tended to kind of like be old, like old wizards keeping their spell books to themselves kind of thing. Yeah. I think that day is gone now because an open ecosystem is actually a better ecosystem it's part and parcel of what required to automate a network. You just can't do it without it. So I'm again. I, I'm. It's 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 quite a different shift from telco of four G. It's all happening around five G, but it's not five G in and of itself. That's just a radio tech. But there's a number of a number of items have come together to to really see this thing kick off. And you know there will absolutely be uh, slices in a network which are provisioned in particular ways, can be more secure in particular ways. Yeah. Um, but in the end, it's how the service providers exposing their network to allow people to do different things with experiences is ultimately going to be what fuels a lot of what goes on. And guys like Amir and I will be, uh, you know, cheering in the sidelines and and hopefully trying to keep up with guys like Mark in terms of innovating the uh, the services that he needs. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. You know, one of the things that uh, I've talked to a few people about this week is the idea that this isn't upgrading an old network to 5G. This is about building a new 5G network and purpose built to be able to serve today's needs. Mark, when you, when you hear that and when you think about that, what are the advantages of being able to launch a 5G network as opposed to trying to upgrade? I think the biggest innovation uh, is not going to be technology. I mean, it's cool, but it's going to be the business model. Um, the way we are, I, I don't like to talk about a network because for me, we, we don't have a network uh, to sell. Uh, we have services and we want to give the keys to the enterprises. Um, they need to, to master and manage uh, policy management, subscriber management, security, to the extent that if they want to tap into our resources with their own policy manager from somebody else, fine, do that. If they want to have their own subscriber and SIM card management outside of this, fine, do that. Um, tell us what you want and how we can help you, but it is your network, it is not ours and your network will, will be populated with your data and your insight, and, and our job is to disappear and give as much consumption of, of uh, you know, artifacts and capabilities that just help them do it. Yeah. Uh, but we don't know what the healthcare and hospital needs. We need, we need to give them the keys, right? Um, and the second uh, biggest innovation is uh, bringing to the telco uh, a, a developer ecosystem. You know, if, if you look at the cloud guys, where are they good? They bring, it's easy for developer, low entry uh, barrier. In the telco world, it's so hard. Nobody can get in. And uh, we want people to be able to uh, do an application or, or spin off a new in, uh, network, a complete new network across the US in one, in one push. Yeah. And that's what we, we're rehearsing, right? Yeah. Right yeah. now, and <laughs> it's, that's what it should be. Yeah. Right? Yeah. No, fantastic. Picking up on that, Amir, I mean, Amazon has been a great enabler of new business models, of new businesses, um, particularly kind of small and, and medium-sized businesses. When you think of 5G in a public cloud, how do you think about continuing you know, that support you've provided to the, the small and medium businesses of the world? I think it will only accelerate that support because uh, we all know one thing for sure, that 5G globally is going to unlock new business opportunities, new use cases. We, don't, can, we can't specifically pinpoint which particular use cases. So to Mark's point, and as Niall was saying, like essentially what we can enable by bringing the cloud and telecom operators closer together, the large amount of developers that today develop their, their applications on AWS, if we can help them get, get the access to the 
and become the telco or trans get transformed into this telco developer so that we actually differentiate between a cloud developer and a telco developer and a developer is a developer. And, and that will unlock many, many new use cases, many, many new business models. One last point I just want to mention, since you asked me like, how do we see this proliferate? I think there's a great opportunity uh, for us to, to learn and pivot, which is the fundamental of a cloud business model, the agility that we, we'll make mistakes, I mean all do, uh, but uh, we can recover very, very quickly. We can be, we can iterate really, really quickly. And the last point I just want to mention like this, I'll just leave you with an example. We, we talk about RIC and near real-time RIC and some of these fancy terms in the context of technology, but let's just look at them from a con in the context of a business application. The amount of data that you can actually generate in a network, and if you have a public cloud platform, imagine what can you do to train those machine learning models in the public cloud, bring them back and execute at the edge for your use case. It, it doesn't have to be IoT, it doesn't have to be AIML, it could be anything. But your use case, your data, your machine learning model, and you run wherever you want. If the customers can have the access, our common customers at the end of the day, it will unlock substantial opportunity. Yeah, yeah, without a doubt. You know, what, what do you see coming, you know, as, as you discuss at Amdocs, and, and what are the future business models, and what are your customers asking for? Yeah, I think, uh, look, a, a lot of it comes down to um, the investment, the capital investment in the 5G radio network is enormous. Um, the infrastructure, if you get it right, and I think the vendor community are responding now to a, a requirement to do it differently, there's still a very large legacy 4G, 3G, even 2G in parts of the world business. It's converging with the fiber piece because I think the telcos are in the right mindset to say, the business of connectivity is hugely important. The business of enablement is hugely important. Um, and there will be very cool things in the consumer space around AR and VR and, and things like that. But in the end, a lot of what, what will make 5G work is it becomes background convenience services that people don't even think about. And they, they just happen. And this is an enabling capability. I have a 15-year-old son at home, and I was describing to him just before I came down to Mobile World Congress, how I used to buy a magazine every week and it used to have a, a floppy disk which had uh, open source programs which I put in on the floppy disk into a machine that had no hard drive when I was a kid, right? And he was describing, well, how do you get software updates? <laughs> you, know, and, you know, we're in that kind of zone of, if you roll forward, probably on most three years from now, people will remember 4G and before the public cloud in that same, kind of nostalgic way, because this, when this is happens in telco, uh, I was talking to one of the guys earlier on about the, the move from Unix to Linux back in the noughties. Yeah. When this happens, it, it falls like a, a, like a waterfall, mm -hmm. and suddenly it's conventional wisdom, and it's good, and everybody does it, and the vendor community, who sometimes can be slower than the operators, you know, step up, they form the right relationships, they form the right partnerships, uh, and so, uh, you know, I think the business of the future is that, that enablement of convenience, whether it's business to business or business to business, you know, to consumer or whatever the case may be. Uh, so, uh, you know, for me, I'm, this idea of, you know, would there ever be a dumb pipe and wireless and what happens to fiber and all that stuff, it's irrelevant, it's utterly outmoded. If you think about the mission of the telco is the provision of uh, that enabling capability, which just becomes less background productivity. Yeah, great, thanks, Neil. Mark, final thoughts from you before we close out. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm talking about what I've seen here. Uh, when we started, it was, we, we didn't invent anything, we were just consuming what was cool, but we were a bit alone, right? And now it's like everybody's talking the same language. I'm amazed by uh, all uh, our, our partners, you know, the, the, the Cisco's, the IBM's, the Dell's, the, you know, these two guys. Uh, I mean, I'm amazed. That's, how, that's the story we want. Yeah. So now we were, you know, a trendsetter maybe at the beginning. A big, a big, now we are in the middle of the ecosystem and we can consume it and uh, mass market, so cool. You know, I, I feel so uh, energized by this, like, you know, it, it, it's coming to us now. So I, I think it's really a great show for that. Yeah, great, thank you, Mark. 
I think that about wraps up our time. So Niall, Mark, uh, Amir, thank you so much for joining us. And thank you all for joining us this morning. Appreciate it.